Welcome to the uh, Anti-Capitalist Chronicles, a uh, podcast uh, sponsored through Politics in Motion. And uh, one of the issues that I want to take up is really a foundational issue for uh, understanding where we are at right now. Because one of the things that I've been finding is that um, people take modes of analysis from some period in the past and present it as if somehow it is relevant in the present. At the same time, I find myself sort of uh, defending the idea that just because Marx wrote in the middle of the 19th century that he is by definition out of date. So I want to, if you like, take both of those positions, that is, an understanding that it's very important to recognize the times in which Marx was writing and the kinds of issues that uh, were very prominent and which he had to take account of. And these it, uh, issues are those which founded his theorizing of how capital actually works. Chris Caruso, Director of Politics in Motion. I'm a popular educator, community organizer, and educational technologist. Politics in Motion is a new anti-capitalist media platform founded in May 2023 by David Harvey, Miguel Robles Duran, and myself. We're working to create an intellectual strike force from the left. Our collective aim is to unsettle and combat the ideas of the billionaire class. We are assembling leading thinkers on our podcast to redefine strategies to build socialism in a transdisciplinary, non-sectarian way. We're proud to offer our Patreon supporters exclusive monthly live question and answer sessions with our podcasters. Questions will be submitted in advance as well as live so that our supporters can dialogue directly with our team. Podcasts from Laura Rakovic and from Ecuador, Ana Rodriguez will be launching soon. And we're thrilled to announce that we have new podcasters joining our team. From Brazil, Raquel Rolnick. From the UK, Andy Merrifield. And from the US, Willie Baptist, Sierra Taylor, and John Wessel McCoy. Our aim is to have all our podcasts launched by the end of 2023. Please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash politics in motion. Thank you. But things have changed. And the question arises then as to whether uh, we should really utilize Marx, and if so, how should we utilize Marx? And I want to have a proposition here uh, to say this, that when we begin with Marx, we begin with the foundational concepts at that time. But Marx was a dynamic thinker, and he recognized that capital was always in the process of becoming. It was always in change, and that therefore, as it changed, however, it carried with it uh, all of those traces from its past, so that you cannot simply dismiss everything that Marx had to say about capital back in the middle of the 19th century and say it is irrelevant to the present circumstance. No, it is the seed from which the present circumstance grew. And I think I want to talk a little bit about one of the major features, which is radically different from Marx's time to ours, and at the same time, try to make the point that a lot of the analysis that we have these days is very much colored by these new circumstances, but there is no accounting, if you like, for what those new circumstances are about. The simplest way to think about this is to really ask the question, uh, uh, why uh, do we actually think of the United States as being the most powerful economy in the world and everything that happens in the United States? And, and why is everybody now saying, well, China is catching up or maybe even will surpass? Exactly 
in what Sanskrit surpass? That China is a better society, a smaller society, uh, a richer society? No. What we actually have to look at is the size of China, the size of the United States. And so suddenly the big question is, how big are things these days? And to in what sense uh, is Marx's theory, which was really geared to a world which was fairly kind of small scale and uh, in many ways rather intimate compared to, to, to the current situation, in what ways is that changing radically by the kinds of uh, scale at which capital is now operating works? Um, in a former podcast, I talked a little bit about this, and I think one of the things I pointed out was that in 1950, the global economy in constant dollars was worth about nine, $9 trillion. Uh, when we get to the period before COVID, uh, the, the global economy was $90 trillion. So there's been a tenfold increase uh, over the last 70-odd uh, years. Now, tenfold increase over 70 years, okay, it's manageable. But then you start to think of it. Let's say, uh, what is uh, an economy which doubles? Uh, and if it is $9 trillion, well, you've got to find new uh, things to do with uh, another $9 trillion. And that's a big sort of task, but it's, it seems to be manageable. But when you say, OK, we have the economy is $90 trillion and we're going to double it, we've got to find new, new things to do with $90 trillion. And that's, a, in other words, the scale at which capital is now working is radically different from that which existed in Marx's time. And that notion of bigness and, and scale and, and, and all the rest of it takes up, I think, more and more of uh, our, our time, even though most people tend to ignore it. So that we will take something like uh, the, the climate change crisis and all the rest of it and say, well, we have a particular problem right now, but, and somehow or other we can, we can deal with that problem uh, by internalizing it within the growth strategies of a capitalist economy, by having a green capitalism, and or, or even when it's not greenwashing, but it could be real, or, or, or we change things uh, radically. And by changing things radically, uh, we presume that we have solved the problem. Uh, I think, for example, right now it's a very interesting kind of moment. Uh, we have a a strike going on of uh, the United Auto Workers, uh, and, and so this is a sort of conventional class struggle uh, issue, and everybody feels comfortable with that. But one of the issues that uh, exists in that strike is the whole conversion uh, somehow to uh, electric vehicles as opposed to the internal combustion engine. And uh, somehow or other, this is thought that this is going to be the solution or one of the major solutions to the, to the climate problem. Well, uh, I think it actually tends to look like this. Uh, the global economy has been uh, accelerating, moving faster, growing faster, uh, and uh, it's headed towards, uh, in some ways, I think a, a calamitous uh, a collision with the realities of uh, what exists uh, on planet Earth to be able to be exploited. And I think, well, in, in a way, what if you've asked me to sort of talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the climate crisis and the, the, the electrification of the automobile industry, then, and, 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 and electronic, electric vehicles and so on. When, if you ask me to talk about that, then what I'm going to say is that, well, it seems to me that that whole automobilization process, which has gone on worldwide and has con accelerated over time to the point where now we have an enormous number of vehicles in the United States, 
And somehow or other, what we've done is we've said, well, this is a problem for uh, the environment uh, in terms of air quality and also in terms of global warming and so on. So we, we switch. Uh, and it's, it's almost like you, you, uh, an express train racing down one track and towards calamity and somebody says, well, we can get out of this by building another uh, track, if you like, which everything can go on. And that's going to take a lot of reinvestment, uh, a fantastic amount of absorption of surplus capital and labor uh, into the retooling of the automobile industry to produce these new kinds of vehicles and render the old ones uh, obsolescent and so in the end we'll have a huge, huge problem of junk disposal of old automobiles in order to wait way for the electric ones. And this system which, which was powering towards a calamitous collision with the realities of the world uh, is supposedly solved by shifting to this other track. Uh, my answer to that is it's not at all. In fact, uh, the whole question of what is going to happen to the automobile industry and the automob automobilization of the world, which has been going on now for, uh, you know, almost 100 years, uh, this, the, this, is the, this is the problem that needs to be looked at and it is now occurring at a scale which uh, is radically different from what it was, say, uh, 50 years ago. So in the same way that uh, we have this extreme expansion and uh, an increase in size uh, of the, what the capitalist economy is about, uh, some of that size is reflected in the fact that the number of automobiles being produced is increasing. It's now they're electronic as opposed to, to gas powered. And, and I, I don't think that really makes any difference. We are still hurtling towards a really big problem in terms of being able to sustain uh, a, a tripling of the automobile output uh, over the, say, the next uh, 10, 15 years. We, we, we've still got that problem. Now, uh, of course, it will no longer be uh, drawing upon fossil fuels, but then you will suddenly turn around and you'll see, you know, vast mountains torn apart in Latin America looking for lithium. Uh, and, you know, the, the whole part of kind of problem of uh, uh, sort of uh, rare earth metals and so on, which are required. We have a completely different uh, world of uh, uh, organization of the, 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 the buying and selling and, and so on of automobiles. We, at some point or other, we will find, uh, you know, we have to dispose of all, all of those old automobiles, which are no longer, uh, if somebody says, OK, only electronic vehicles, electrical vehicles from now on. You can see, you can see the situation. So one of the things that I would want to emphasize is that we need to think very carefully about the scale at which capital is operating. And as it changes scale and as it moves into something which is much, much larger, we then get this, this problem of, well, uh, over the next uh, 50 years, we're going to have to find new uh, consumption and production uh, outlets for uh, the amount of value or the amount of money which is circulating as capital, which... Uh, uh, right now is nine, just about $90 trillion, but we going to be talking about $180 trillion. So this is, this, is, this is really one of the ways in which we then kind of say, well, the growth incentive and the growth uh, machine, as it were, has to be dismantled. And it has to be dismantled in a way that somehow or other allows us to meet current needs, but we have organized society so that we all automatically need an automobile. I suddenly find myself needing an automobile. I have to have one. Uh, people have to have one to get around. It's a, it's a major, major thing. So what to do about the automobile over the next uh, you know, 30 or 40 years seems to me to be a, 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 a crucial kind of question that need, needs to be uh, thoroughly addressed. But, uh, well, the way it's being addressed right now is to say, well, actually, the automobile industry is uh, absorbing a vast amount of surplus capital. Uh, it'll absorb a certain amount of labor, 
by switching from conventional automobile production to electrical vehicle uh, production. And, and somehow or other, this is seen as also satisfying the problem of uh, the environmental difficulties that have come with uh, climate change and all the rest of it. I don't think it's going to do it at all. In fact, I think it's going to make matters much worse. So that here we have a situation where by just thinking through the implications of a doubling of the economy over the next, I don't know, 10 years or something of that kind, thinking through the implications of that, and that that is what capital requires, says, well, let's say, let's look at that choice. Do we want to say, OK, let's end capitalism, and then we won't have to increase by, uh, the, you know, double over the output over the next 10 years? Or do we say, OK, well, we're going to go for a doubling of output over the next 10 years, and by the way, one of the ways we can do that is to somehow render our current fleet of automobiles entirely redundant and, and we declare that everybody has to have an elec electrical vehicle uh, by, uh, I don't know, 2035 or something like that. So you see what, you see what I'm saying? But we now have to understand that this is the kind of choice we are making without discussion. That is, we don't discuss it as if to say, should we do this or should we do that? What we do is to say, oh, we're going to do that, and that seems to solve the problem. But it doesn't solve the problem. And if we start to look around at all of the, the, the solutions that are being proposed, particularly to the environmental question, but the same thing applies, I think, to uh, 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 social inequality that we kind of say, look, social inequality has got out of hand. It's, it's gone completely uh, uh, wacko. And we have now the, the billionaire class and the, you know, the, the autocracy uh, there, um, you know, corrupting the world with their money and with their desires. And we find now that the Supreme Court in the United States has been essentially a vehicle for the Koch brothers and uh, the other billionaires to actually get uh, completely new legal uh, uh, determinations as to what can or cannot be done uh, by by government interventions. So we have all of these 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 issues which we're looking at, and we're not really kind of sitting it down, saying what's the real issue here. And the real, I think, the real issue, and uh, go back to the central thing, the real issue is this whole kind of question of size. Uh, and, uh, and, and how huge, uh, how uh, Marx used to use this word, monstrous. So to him, what was going on on the stock exchanges uh, in the mid-19th century was a monstrous utilisation of monstrous amounts of money to do monstrous things. And so he, we use that kind of language. Uh, well, if he could use that back then, we could use it now. But now, uh, it's not monstrous in the same way at all. It's actually totally monstrous. And, and actually uh, is likely to result in making the, the Earth a rather uninhabitable uh, for, for most of the world's population. And we're already seeing some kind of consequences of that with these migratory streams coming from all over the world, different parts of the world uh, actually being depopulated uh, because uh, they cannot sustain uh, their populations anymore. So what we're, go what we're moving into is a situation where the foundational problem, which is the scale, and the scale is constantly increasing because capital has always been about accumulation. Accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. And it's always been about increasing scale because of the profit requirement, that what motivates everything is profit, and profit means you have something more at the end of the day than you had at the beginning of the day. And then who has it and what happens to it and so on is then up for grabs. But there is therefore, a, uh, if you like, uh, the laws of motion of capital, which Marx identified well, you know, way back in the middle of the 19th century, continue to apply. But the laws are about uh, the laws of accumulation and the laws of production and as such, it's about increasing the scale of the problem that we have to deal with. And because we're increasing the scale of the problem we have to deal with, 
we have to actually start to think about politics organizing at a rather different scale. What goes on right now is that we, you know, politics is fine at the very local level. Uh, it's not so fine whereas you go up the chain, you go to the metropolitan level, uh, you go to the national level, you go to the global level. But right now, what we have to do is to start to think about a political program which is actually going to stop this process of continuously doubling uh, the, 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 the economy's size uh, every 10, 15, maybe whatever years it is. We have to slow that down, stop it, and that means, of course, at a certain point, uh, doing away with the, the profit motive as the, the guiding force uh, for, for, for uh, economic activity. And uh, all of those institutions which are set up uh, to actually measure and uh, or, organize uh, the, the, the profit uh, production, all of those have to be radically reconfigured uh, so that we actually produce uh, less and less or find modes of production uh, which do not involve mass consumption and mass production in the way that is currently the case. So this is one of the foundational things I think and I, I've long been sort of concerned with the fact that uh, a sort of 10% rate of return uh, on a uh, hundred dollars is, is uh, you know, one thing. Uh, a 2% rate of return on millions and trillions of dollars is another thing. So that what we have to do is to come back to that basic kind of mathematical, simple equation and say we cannot continue uh, in, the, in the mode we are currently going. And that in it fa then faces a real, real serious problem because there are may many areas of the world which are desperate for new forms of development, who are desperate for for, for uh, uh, increase of productivity uh, and increases of product. Many parts of the world which, which if they are not, uh, if those de desires are not met, is likely to result in this uh, increase in, in in migratory movements. Uh, which are uh, seriously, seriously uh, changing uh, the demographic structures uh, that the world is facing these days. So this is a, uh, if you like, a, a major, a major question always to be kept in mind. Which doesn't mean that we can somehow or other chop down and stop production and stop this elect conversion into electric vehicles and so on. But we have to rethink what the possible consequences are. And we're not really thinking through uh, the future consequences of current actions. Because in many ways, what we're doing is that we're condemning the future by our present decisions. And our present decisions are not, it seems to me, being shaped by actually focusing on one of the biggest issues of all time, which is how big can the capitalist economy get? And what are going to be the consequences of that bigness? And as it gets more closer and closer to some some edge uh, uh, beyond which we cannot go, uh, what are we going to do? And maybe we should actually take that into account right now and start to think that problem through uh, very seriously as a political question which needs to be on the front of the agenda rather than uh, basically forgotten about or taken as self-evident. Uh, so that's, if you like, the issue that I would like to really concentrate on right now and it's the one that keeps me most awake at night.